Greetings everyone, you're watching David, The Real Medvites. Today I want to bake a video on leavened bread. This is a topic that I wanted to cover for a couple of months now. And this video is not intended for really purely apologetical purposes. It's more so explaining our view on leavened bread. Uh, this You don't really see many discussions on this topic either. And it's kind of strange because it's a very important discussion, right? I mean, we use leavened bread in the Eucharistic celebration. It's a core part of our liturgy, and it's one of the main differences we have with the with the West, whether it's Roman Catholic or even Protestant, right? Because Roman Catholic West more often uses unleavened bread, whereas, to my knowledge, we completely do not use it. Even in the Western Rite, we don't use unleavened bread at all. Um, and even in the East, although we're not speaking about Orthodox here, even in the East with uh, the Monophysites, particularly the Armenians, uh, not all Monophysites, but the Armenians, for example, use unleavened bread. Why is this the case? It is, is it even an important distinction? Is it even an important topic to talk about? It is, right? There are symbolically important things to consider here. And so I want to explain uh, this in this video as short as I possibly can. Again, it's an exhaustive video, and I will be mainly using two writings. I will be heavily borrowing from these two writings. Some of them I'll just directly be quoting from them. Uh, one of them is an article from St. John the Evangelist Orthodox Church. The other is a Twitter thread by a friend of mine. Both of them, you can find them in the description below. So let's just begin this video. What is leaven in the first place? I'm, this is going to be a very simplistic explanation. Um, especially leaven, you know, in, in many ways is synonymous with the word yeast. Yeast is a bacteria that uh, once it is on the bread, it kind of just covers all of the bread, right? It just spreads through the rest of the bread. It has certain visible characteristics, but it's because it's a bacteria, it also has invisible characteristics as well. And so bad yeast can completely ruin the bread, whereas good yeast can, you know, make the bread eatable, right? And this is going to be very important for symbolism. I think some of you might even predict what the symbolism is going to be about. And, you know, and unleavened bread is just kind of, you know, it's just simply you just mix flour and water and bada bing, bada boom. It's just done. Right. It, they look like crackers. They, they're they flat. They're, they're very, they're made in a very simple way. So let's start with, you know, let's just talk about leavened bread, unleavened bread in scriptures. Right. Both of them are used in scriptures. Unleavened bread is used in the Old Testament, like you know Exodus and uh, Exodus twelve and thirteen. We can see kind of you know the first time we encountered unleavened bread here, we can see that uh, the Israelites ate unleavened bread because of their powerlessness. So there's kind of like this bitter element to it, and the the lack of leaven seems to kind of represent this lack of human activity because you know the Exodus. It's not really the plan of the people. It was God's providence that played part in that. Uh, we see that in sacrifices, leavened bread was rarely, if ever, used for sacrifices at all, whereas it was used for thanksgiving. Now, we need to remember that thanksgiving in the Old Testament is a type of the liturgy because the liturgy is the work of the people. So we can see here, even in the Old Testament, leavened bread has this association with the works of the people, right? Remember what we just said. Uh, in the beginning of the video, a bad yeast can completely ruin the bread, but good yeast can make the bread eatable, make the bread good, basically. And, you know, it's just a very basic way to describe it. But uh, it was used in Thanksgiving, as we see, as we can see here in Leviticus. Leaven also has an association with the kingdom of God, and we will see later on that St. John Chrysostom talks about this extensively. In Matthew 13.33, we can see Christ using a parable also in Luke 13, 20-21, where the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was leavened. What, what does this even mean? Well, St. John Chrysostom is going to explain us very uh, soon. But we also see that leaven is associated with Pharisees. Right? Christ tells us that we should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And St. Paul affirms this and speaks of the leaven of the Pharisees, characterizes them as pride. Right, so we can see that the leaven, right, it's characterizing the works, the works of the Pharisees, is pride. And 
this is the kind of contrast of old leaven versus new leaven. There's the old leaven of the Pharisees, whereas there is the new leaven of Christ. Um, and, and as we can see, again, we want to repeat this, leaven symbolizes the activities of the faithful. So it's, it's goodness, it being good or bad, is dependent on human activity. Now, when we speak of human activity, we're not merely speaking of the activities of the people, although they are also part of it. But we will see again further on that it's going to include the human activities of Christ himself. So St. Ignatius of Antioch in his epistle to the Manicians says, Lay aside therefore the evil, the old, the sour leaven, and be ye changed into the new leaven, which is Jesus Christ. St. John Chrysostom on his third homily on demons says, Hear at least what Christ says unto his disciples. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a woman who took leaven and hid it in three measures of meal, so that the righteous have the power of leaven in order that they may transfer the wicked to their own manner of conduct. But the righteous are few, for the leaven is small, but the smallness in no way injures the lump, which is the people, right? Which is the, which is the congregation, it's the church. But the little quality, uh, sorry, quantity of leaven spreads throughout the whole lump and converts the whole of the meal to itself by means of the power inherent in it, right? So Christ, by taking on human nature and by his human activities that are deified due to his, the, its hypostatic union with the divine nature, not only deifies human nature in himself, but deifies us by his activities. And so those who do good works in this leaven uh, contribute to the goodness of the bread, so to speak. You can think of it this way. And the power of the righteous is not in number, but it's in the grace of the Holy Spirit. He gives the example of there being 12 apostles. Do you see how little is the leaven? The whole world was in unbelief. Do you see how great is the lump? But those 12 turned the whole world to themselves. The leaven and the lump had the same nature, but not the same manner of conduct. On this account, he left the wicked in the midst of the good, that since they are of the same nature as the righteous, they may also become of the same purpose, right? So the, again, the yeast, the bacteria, spreads throughout the entirety of the bread and takes on the bread in itself. So whether the bread is good or bad is entirely dependent on the leaven itself. And so we are supposed to be taking the leaven of Christ onto ourselves. St. Irenaeus of Lyons in Against the Heresies says that the Savior received first fruits of those whom he was to save. Paul declared when he said, and if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. Teaching that the expression first fruits denoted that which is spiritual, but that the lump meant us, that is the animal church, the lump of which they say he assumed and blended it with himself inasmuch as he is the leaven. Christ took on human nature and blended us with him. And this is why we are deified in the divine energies of God, because Christ's human nature was uh, deified by his own divine energies. And this applies to the leavened bread. Leavened bread is part of that symbolism. All right? In contrast, we can see that in the constitutions of the Holy Apostles, unleavened bread has this bitter, dead characteristic to it. Uh, we, it says, Keep your nights of watching in the middle of the days of unleavened bread, and when the Jews are feasting, do you fast and veil over them? Because on the day of their feast they crucified Christ, and while they are lamenting and eating unleavened bread in bitterness, do you feast? So unleavened bread is also inherently contradictory to the joyfulness of liturgical celebration because unleavened bread is about mourning. It's about bitterness. Um, and it's also about putting off the old man, but Christ did not have an old man to put off in the first place. The old man is the man uh, before, in, in, in our sense, is before baptism, but really before illumination. Christ was illumined from his birth, by right, his divine nature. So, Let's now talk a little bit about council canons and the church father. And, you know, we talked about church fathers. Let's talk about a little bit about canons on unleavened bread. Uh, canon 11 of the Council of Trullo, which is accepted by the Seventh Ecumenical Council, uh, says, Let no one in the priesthood order nor any layman eat the unleavened bread of the Jews. So unleavened bread is associated with the Jews here, and that we're not supposed to eat it um, in, any, in, a, in any Eucharistic celebrations. Uh, this book, well, not this book, but this excerpt from a book is from uh, Orthodox and Differences with Papism by Bhagavos Grigoris. It was translated by Mercurio Cruxi Genito. I don't know if that's a real name, 
but that's what it says here. Um, and it kind of makes more points. Some of the points that he makes is that, first of all, that leavened bread was used in the Last Supper here in, pa in the second page. Um, I believe it's because of the artos azimos distinction, right? Artos usually just means bread, whereas azimos means unleavened bread, right? And so the, the Last Supper used the term artos for bread. I think that's the argument from what I've understood. That's what I've heard a couple of months ago, uh, more than a year ago, actually, uh, pro more properly speaking. Uh, it uses Council of Cancer, Cantor, the other uh, Council of Laodicea, Canon 70 of the Holy Apostles, um, Canon 11 of the Sixth Ecumenical uh, Council, I believe that was Trullo, maybe also the Sixth Ecumenical Council. But here, the author associates, he, by citing St. Peter of Antioch, he associates uh, unleavened bread with the Ebionites due to their Judaizing. So there are two aspects of unleavened bread. It's either a form of Judaizing or it's a form of a Christological heresy. So first, uh, the Judaizers use unleavened bread, certain Judaizers, and then we have Apollinarians, and then the 6th century Armenian Monophysites, and, and they're on. Now, why will Apollinarians use unleavened bread, right? Uh, well, it's more so, why will St. Peter associate unleavened bread? It's more, this is more accurate. Why will St. Peter of Antioch associate unleavened bread with the Apollinarians? He says that those who participate in liturgies with unleavened bread are in danger of slowly falling into the heresy of Apollinaris. He dared to say that the Son and Word of God took from the flesh of the Blessed Virgin a body without soul and mind. Right, this is the heresy of Apollinarianism. And we made a video on uh, Dr. William Lane Craig on his Neo-Apollinarianism in detail. If you want to watch that, you can check that out. Uh, replacing these two elements with his divinity, those who offer unleavened bread give as an offering dead and not living flesh because leaven plays the part of the soul in the dog right he says the same he further explains the body of the lord is everywhere called bread artos because it is perfect and complete not unleavened because unleavened is a dead and soulless thing and in general is incomplete on the contrary the leaven put into the dove of floor acts as a soul and solidifying element is not absurd and then that those who believe in Christ God should regard the incomplete, the dead, and soulless as the living and life-giving flesh of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Right? So if you didn't understand the argument, I'll, I'll try to explain it in more simpler terms. I think it is quite simple enough. Basically, you know, we believe in the real presence. There's a transformation of the Eucharistic bread into the, uh, the body of Christ. And the wine transforms into the blood of Christ. And... To say that Christ is transformed from unleavened bread to his body is to the 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 bread symbolizes the it's 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 the body right if you use unleavened bread we're saying that his body is dead right we're talking about a dead body here not only a dead but also an incomplete soulless body that lacks a human activity that's the problem with it right that's the that's the theological christological problem with using unleavened bread and the, the Eucharist is, a, is, again, a very key portion, a very key aspect of the divine liturgy. And so the, the, the issue of leavened and unleavened bread is a very serious issue. Right? A lot of people, they love to act as if, oh, you know, these people debate all these silly things and they just find new things to debate about and just attack people who make, you know, videos like this or articles like my friend on Twitter made uh, on, you know, leavened bread etc but it's a very important thing it's a very important thing that we we're talking about here it has an incredible symbolical meaning and if you don't understand an incredibly symbolic meaning you're really going to you're basically about abandoning a very crucial aspect of apostolic christianity and so the orthodox church really is the only church that uses leavened bread completely other churches um, they compromise on this issue, and I do think that kind of tells us something here. Again, this is not an exhaustive video. This is not a purely apologetical video. It's more so a video explaining the Orthodox position. And I do think it will be beneficial if people started to kind of, you know, get more into this topic, talk a bit more about this topic as well. We might learn something new, because I do think this is a quite an underrated topic. And I hope that 
this video has helped you understand a bit more on leavened bread. And so I would like to thank you all for watching this. If you like this, like, subscribe to the channel, comment some cool stuff, share it with your friends if you want them to learn about this stuff. And do check out the articles in the description below as well. Again, thank you for watching. I will see all of you in the next video. May God be with you all. Thanks for watching.